Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Former All-American Boise State football player Joe O'Brien's fall from grace was stunning. From a star on the football field to an inmate in a federal prison convicted of meth distribution. How did he hide years of addiction and why is he now seeking redemption? Find out. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. Joe O'Brien was a hero, a standout high school football player and high school sophomore class president. Western Football Conference defensive lineman of his year at Santa Clara University and an All-American and Big Sky Conference defensive player of the year for Boise State University. It seemed like he had nowhere to go but up. But after a try at the NFL failed, O'Brien turned to coaching, first at Northern University, Arizona University, and then eventually became assistant head coach at Montana State University. Again, it seemed like he was on his way to success. But in 2003, O'Brien's world collapsed when he was arrested for his part in a methamphetamine drug distribution ring. He served 28 months in a federal prison, getting clean and coming to grips with what he called the lie. In the book Busted Bronco, From Addiction to Redemption, O'Brien tells a cautionary tale of how of years of drug abuse robbed him of the football career he loved. Joe O'Brien joins me now. Joe, thank you for being here. I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Also, we're being joined by Joe's co-author, Bob Ivancho. If Bob looks familiar, he's been on Dialogue before as the author of a biography of Gene Harris, among other things. He's also a colleague of mine here at Idaho Public Television. It's nice to throw you in front of the camera instead of being behind the scenes. Good to be here, Joan. Thanks. And of course, we want to hear from you. Join the conversation. Give us a call at 1-800-973-9800. It, it must be tough talking about such a, a tough life, a tough addiction, telling the story over and over again. Why did you decide to write a book about it? Well, I think I, I, think I wrote it for a couple of reasons. I think number one, I had to get, get it all out. I think for so long, for 15 to 16 years, I, I held it in so much. and. You know, I was living that lie, and and um, just the guilt that that had built up, you know, was just I think it was killing me. And uh, finally, when I you know when I got arrested, you know, it gave me a couple years, you know, two and a half years to to really reflect on my life and where I was and what I did and and who really I was. And I just felt like it was, uh, you know, if I couldn't coach again because I just thought that that wasn't going to be the case, you know, after because of what happened. I just felt like I still needed to do something in this world, and I just felt like it would help. It would help a kid, or help a coach, or help somebody um, if I was able to write it. And then, uh, you know, the biggest thing was is be able to write the book. And then, what's kind of happening now is for me to be able to speak in different high schools and colleges and stuff like that, and be able to get the message out. Well, Bob, why did you decide to write this book? Uh, obviously, this is a different type of book than a biography of Pokey Allen or Gene Harris. Uh, well, the. Pokey Allen, who you mentioned, was the main reason that Joe and I uh, got together in the first place. Uh, during the, the course of Pokey's career and, and uh, with uh, Boise State football since uh, the mid-80s, I've been part of uh, the, the press corps that covered Boise State football, either with uh, Focus Magazine as an employee for Boise State or as a stringer for the Associated Press or sports writer uh, with the Statesman and other newspapers. So I'd always been around Boise State football got to know Pokey uh, in 1996 quite well when I collaborated with his autobiography. So uh, Joe called me out of the blue in August of th 2008 saying, hey, do you remember me? And I, well, I said, of course I do. You know, he was uh, the, 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 uh, the key player on that team. So it was my relationship with Pokey and, and Joe's that really brought us together. And uh, as soon, as soon after we started talking, um, that uh, a couple weekends later, in, in uh, September of uh, 2008, I, I absolutely wanted in. It was a. He started telling me about um, his. Joe started telling me about his story, about his arrest, his conviction, his time in prison, what happened before and after that. And I said, absolutely, I want in. Well, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about your life. You, you know, you had a very, you know, not an easy childhood. A lot of violence. Uh, a father who was addicted to drugs went to prison. And then eventually he died when you were 17. How did that death impact your life? You know, 
growing up and people people ask me that all the time growing up I was probably raised around you know not probably I was raised around parents that basically did stuff that you weren't supposed to do and um, you would think growing up that I would learn from some of those lessons you know and you know my father you know and my mother alcohol and drug related they would fight and um, they would be physical and it would just be you know it'd be horrible for me to watch and I just kind of saw what drugs did and it's you know and then when my father went, you know, he died, or he, he actually killed a lady, you know, with drunk driving when, when I was younger, and, um, and I had to, to live through that, and then, um, uh, and then obviously he died of a, of a heroin overdose, and I think at that point, I just, you know, I was 16 years old at the time, I turned 17 the next month, and it was one of those deals where I just felt like I, I had to walk this world by myself, and that's where it started really heavily, I think, and then come to find out I couldn't. I wasn't, you know, in maybe society's eyes and my coach's eyes and the media's eye and, you know, my teammates' eyes and stuff that I could, you know, walk tall and be a man on my own. And I was, like you said, looked up to as, you know, as a captain, as a hero and all those things. But inside I was just tearing, you know, I was torn up inside. and. Um, you know, and I don't make any excuses for it, and I don't know why it happened. It's it's hard for me to, to really pinpoint why I chose drugs, but you know, I, I went to drugs, and that's and that's what happened to me. You know, and um, just uh, and it just snowballed. It got worse and worse and worse. So well, let's get to our first caller, Glenn in Chalice. Glenn, go ahead. Let's try that. Let's get that one more time. Glenn, you there? Yeah, I'm here. There we go. How you doing, John? Good. How are you? Doing good. Hey, Joe, I was wondering how you're going to find redemption for the allegations or the convictions you had and what you plan to do about it. Okay. That's kind of the whole point of the, of the interview. Let me speak of it. We talk about redemption. So I'm, I'm going to kind of jump ahead, I guess, here to to more the end of the story, but you're, they, you know, you're, you're, you've got the book title From Addiction to Redemption. So what does redemption mean for you? Redemption just means, you know, a, a guy that, that fell as hard as he could possibly fall. And, and really the, the prison part of it is, is really what the society thinks the fall was. I mean, for me, it was, it was even before that. There was lots of people asked me, what was your low, was your lowest point when the 29 guns were pointed to your head and you were arrested? And there was lots of lows before that. It's just about coming back, coming clean with, with my life, you know, writing a book about coming clean and um, just do, trying to do the right thing every day, just being really, really who I am deep down in my soul, who I really am. But you know, I chose to to mask it sometimes, just personally, and that's why I kept everybody out of it, basically. But um, that that's the redemption part, just just to be able to come back from something like that and be stronger as a person and stronger in my faith and all those things. Well, let's jump back a little bit and and your history. So you your your father died while you were in high school, and yet you continued to play. Yes. Went on to went on to Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, Santa Clara was a was a great place. It, it was a, it was it was a very good place, but it was kind of a bad place for me. It just seemed like that the the majority of my friends that were that were involved in drugs, the small uh, you know crowd that I hung out with, it, it was too close for me. So Santa Clara was a, was an hour drive away, so it was easy for me to go back home and and do that sort of thing. And it just seemed like that. Uh, you know, the playing part of it, the school part of it was very hard for me. I mean, Santa Clara, I felt like I was in over my head. I mean, it was a, it was a private, you know, private school, very expensive school. I mean, there was 14 to one ratio that went there, you know, as far as teacher to student. And uh, so it was it was a hard school, nothing I couldn't handle. Um, but the, you know, the, the coaches were great. I mean, I'm still very close to them and everything. But I just felt like it, it, it's, I knew it was too close. You know, it was always whenever I, something was going on in my life, you know, it was always too easy to drive an hour, you know, and come back. So. And then their their football program ended, and you came to BSU. Yeah, I uh, actually the I I used to still help out with the with the high school program in uh, in Pittsburgh where I grew up, and uh, so I knew the Pittsburgh, coaches. Pittsburgh, California. Pittsburgh, California where I grew up and Joey Aliotti, he won the national championship here in 1980 and he was actually my high school coach. So he, the summer before actually the program dropped, I had no intentions of, of coming to Boise at all, but they, he came up here for the football camp. He'd bring the, the whole, you know, the whole team up. So he invited me to come up and I got to hang out with the legend Joey Aliotti for a week and, uh, you know, 
practice coach on the blue turf with the kids and spend a week and it was just a blast and uh and so when I went back, I played that season out, you know, obviously. And, uh, you know, when, when it came to an end in February, it was just an abrupt end. It was on National Letter of Intent Day in February. And uh, I had tons of schools calling me from all over the place. And, and when Boise called me, I talked to the coaches. I talked to Pokey Allen and Barry Sachs, actually, at the time, was the guy that was recruiting me. And he said, well, I want to bring you up on a trip. I said, just send me the, send me the scholarship. I'm, you know, send me the scholarship because I'm on my way. I don't need a trip. I've already been there. That's how that happened. Joe, can you put his career in, put, put, put Bob, put Joe's career in perspective? How, how good a football player is Joe? Well, what was Joe? Uh, he was a consensus All-American. You get uh, players who make an All-American team here, second team there, honorable mention there. I think uh, Joe and Ryan Clady, there are probably a few others, but there were, you know, what is called a consensus All-American, where you're, you're named to two or three first team uh, All-America teams, uh, and Joe was one one of the few who really is a bona fide consensus All-American. Uh, you know, his record speaks for itself. He was the uh, he earned those honors. He led, helped lead Boise State to the one AA national championship game, and uh, was the Big Sky Defensive Player of the Year. But it wasn't just his uh, his ability as a player; it was also his his charisma and uh, his leadership skills. And I viewed those uh, firsthand back in 94. And so I knew about, uh, you know, his, the, the aura that he had and the, the skills that he had to, you know, he took a lot of the, the team, um, him and some other uh, of the seniors that literally, you know, led that team to, uh, to, um, to its first Big Sky Championship in, in several years, beating Idaho for the first time in 12 years, winning three, extremely exciting uh, playoff games and making it to the national championship game. But the one thing I would add is that we talked, you know, I just mentioned these things, but when we started on this book, we both decided this is not about Joe as a football player. Uh, one of the criticisms of the Pokey Allen book is that uh, we went into too much detail about games and, and, uh, and certain players and that. And Joe and I agreed, you know, there's probably two, maybe three pages for that really talk about uh, games and, and uh, what goes on in the gridiron, it really wasn't that. It was about Joe's struggles with substance abuse and his recovery and all the things that happened to him. You know, football is just a, a, a backdrop to uh, what I think is a, was a very compelling story. Let's get to our next phone caller. Let's see. Um, let's go to uh, Mike in Boise. Mike. Hi. Um, interesting story. I just had a qu quick question for you. Um, I think it's, you know, really nice that uh, he's turned his ripe life around, but, uh, you know, you pick up the paper every day and you'll see different players on both the collegiate and NFL level getting busted for drugs or busted for this and busted for that. So um, it seems like it's a never-ending problem that's never going away. And uh, it seems like what we really see is just the tip of the iceberg about how much of this goes on within athletics around the country and if there ever really is an answer you know to dealing with this it just seems to grow and grow with with no real answer about how to stop it thank you for your comment appreciate mm -hmm. that i don't know in the in your world in that football was was are drugs just the tip of the iceberg in the football i think there's there's a big reason why this book is written i mean i wouldn't write it i mean to think that this was a story that Oh, it's so, you know, compelling in that. Um, Is it unique? It's so in unique, but it's not. It's not unique. And it's not just unique in athletics. I mean, that was the whole thing about it. There's people that live with demons in their closet all the time. And it's just until you, until you get those out, you know, you're never going to change. You know, and sometimes, you know, I was told by my drug treatment special specialist in, uh, in prison, you don't change because you feel the heat or excuse me you don't change because you see the light you change because you feel the heat and that statement really bothered me you know and that's what that's what kind of got me to write this book because there's people out there lots of people and this is just my story this is my story with drugs but there's people with uh, all sorts of other stories that have struggles within their self and that's kind of why I wrote the book well if if the statistics are right one in ten people have a problem with chemical dependency in America so if 10 percent of the population even if 10 percent of athletes as a general representation of the population, have a problem with alcohol or drugs. That's, and they're, 
they're sad cases, they're in the public spotlight. So if they do something wrong, it's plastered all over the front page of the paper. I guess, and to, to go on more on that comment, I mean, if it's, if there's, if he was stating that why, I mean, basically, why are we, why are, why am I doing this? Then I mean, if, if everybody says that, then we wouldn't be able to change anybody. I mean, I speak in front of, I spoke in front of 380 kids last week and I spoke in front of 250 kids and I got 15 emails and two people that I met personally and there's some people that need to be talked to. So if just one of those people, and I know it's a cliche, but it's a cliche that I'll go by, you know, if just one of those kids truly that talk to me want to make a change and a difference in their world and it's worth writing this book. Let's get this, our next caller. Bill in Boise. Bill. Hi. Hi there. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, what would be your uh, advice to players that reach such a high level of, um, you know, won championships at the high school level and then played in college and won championships, but maybe didn't make it to the NFL, but reached such high success at a young age, and then they go out to the workforce, and life just seems kind of boring after that. And so it makes them look for highs after those those experiences um what would be your advice to to that you know reaching such a, a high level of young age and then coming back off a high yeah. that that's a great question in fact um <clears throat> excuse me one of my former players um had a, that exact problem and um he's actually in a in a He's in a treatment program right now that I've actually been helping him with for the last couple months, and that was a major problem with him. And it's a major; it would have been a major problem with me. I mean, to to me, if you're an athletics person, you need to stay around athletics, whether it's with your kids, whether if it's your nephews, if it's whoever, if it's in a coaching atmosphere, or you're, you're just you know, I think you need to stay around athletics if that's who you are. I mean, that's that's my personal opinion. It it is hard to get over the, the adrenaline rush that comes with playing big time sports, big time mm -hmm. college sports, big time high school sports, NFL, you played in the World League, there are other places around the world that you play. That Was that high different than the high you got off of methamphetamine? Well, there's no question about it. I mean, my, I mean, it sounds crazy, but I mean, my, my passion for football had to do strictly with the physical part of it. I mean, the, the actual, you know, what I got asked today, I was watching practice and I said, well, they practice with pads on Thursdays. I used to hate Thursday practices because we never practiced with pads, you know, when I was playing and now they're practicing with pads and, you know, I never liked practices without, um, you know, with, without pads on. It was always about hitting something with my face and it sounds crazy, but that's really what it is. But yeah, that, that's hard to replace. I mean, you know, when I got into coaching, um, it took a couple years for me to figure out that, you know, this is almost better because now I'm actually playing through the eyes of four players that I've coached, you know, a unit, so. Yeah. You, you laughed. Was that something you found in the book, that this, that, that need, need for, for, need for the Thursdays without pads? Well, I, I just know from, you know, spending time with Joe that, uh, the, like I said, the, his love of the game was pure and, uh, and I, I can, having watched him play and, and you know, um, just here, you know, when we talk and worked on the book, I, I know that uh, I just kind of chuckle when he talks about the fact that he'd prefer to have pads on, you know, uh, <laughs> any time at practice, hit somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's difficult for people who have not had an experience from someone who has an addiction or someone who, or may, perhaps they themselves have had addiction, to understand that it's a disease, at least the addiction part, not the, not the behaviors that lead to mm -hmm. or a result of the addiction, but the addiction itself is a disease and coming to grips with that. Have you struggled explaining that part? You know, I have, um, because really, when I, when I was in prison, I went through a nine month drug treatment program. And um, you have to put, you have to say a mission statement in front of 27 other peers that are in this, you know, other inmates that are in this program with you. And, and the basis of my mission statement, it was a three page deal, but it was, I wanted to find why I, I did the things that I did as far as drugs were concerned, why I started them, why I did them. And uh, two and a half to three months into it, my drug treatment specialist brought me into his office and said, look, quit trying to find out the reasons why you're gonna waste nine months in here. Let's figure out how you don't have, how 
a plan of how you won't do it again. Let's let's figure that out instead of going back. So it's hard for me. You're right. It's hard for me to answer that. It's hard for me to. But I just know the symptoms, and I know that it's wrong, and I know that it's got to be changed. You know, and it's got to be changed at an early age. You know, my my problem, my biggest problem is I wasn't exposed. You know, when I speak to to young kids, and and you know, I I, I really like to speak to at risk kids or, or my favorite kids because they're real. You know, they got a problem, their teachers know it, their counselors know it, somebody knows it, and that's the best thing in the world between 15 or, you know, 15 to 19 year old kids. I wish I was exposed at 15 to 19 that I had a problem because I was a good kid. W wasn't there anyone in your life who said, don't do this? Never, never, but there's very, very few people that ever knew about it, you know, and um, it was, you know, and, and I, I mean, it's one of those deals where I wouldn't go to somebody who would tell me no, you know what I mean? It was one of those situations, so, um, well, it was hard. you did an amazing job compartmentalizing your life between when you when in the dr the world where the drugs were a part of it and the world that the fate the that the rest of the saw the the football hero the mm -hmm. the coach the well i mean let's i mean to be totally frank with you i mean football playing it and coaching it is the truest purest thing i've ever done in my life I mean, as far as coaching on the field and being on the, and playing, I mean, that's that's not something that, that can just be, that's something that's turned on and it's phony. You know, you can't get the best out of yourself. You can't get the best out of the players around you. You can't get the best out of the players that you're coaching um, because, you know, people see right through that. So for that, for that, it was, you know, it was the truest, purest thing that I did. But yeah, in, in you know, on my other time, you know, the dark side of my time, it was, you know, it was away from, it was away from that. Bob, what was the reaction when he when when Joe was arrested in Bozeman, the defensive coach for the football? What what happened? Well, I only know from Joe's story because uh, I was in Boise when it yeah. happened in 2003, and I like everybody else read a short article about it in the Statesman. Continued to read, uh, you know, during the trial, and, and then saw that um, you know he was sentenced to uh, four years in federal prison, and I kind of lost. Uh, uh, you know, uh, contact, not that we had it, but, uh, you know, where he was and what he was doing. So when he called me, as I mentioned, the phone call or the email back in 2008, it was out of the blue. I didn't even know he was out of prison. Uh, but I can tell you the reaction, you know, from, from you know. What research you did. Talking yeah. to the research of the people I talked to. And it was, um, it was, uh, people were shocked. Uh, you know, a couple people that we did, you know, this truly is a Joe's memoirs, but I thought, we thought it was important to sprinkle in a, a, a few people to get their perspectives, people who were close to Joe, Brian Smith, um, some other teammates, and one of those was Pete Kwiatkowski, who is, uh, you know, the defensive coordinator at Boise State now. Uh, Pete was Joe's boss at the time, and he uh, gave me a lot of uh, insight and, and uh, reaction to uh, kind of speaking on behalf of the uh, Montana State coaching staff at the time, and he said, you know, it was it was it was disappointment, it was anger, but mostly, and, and there's a word that uh, that Pete used was a betrayal, and that's a pretty strong word to use for you know a friend. So you know the reaction was strong, and there's uh, points in the book where we talk about still the backlash that occurred in Bozeman when Joe returned, um, the, that episode with the snowballs when he uh, was uh, well, at, at the at the game. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I went to a game um, a couple years ago against Sac, Sac State, and uh, actually one of the coaches for Sac State, I coached at Montana State. He was actually a graduate assistant coach there, so I went to go support him. And um, so I was actually on the sideline of Sacramento State, and there was, um, you know, there was some profanities yelled out, yelled out at me, and there were snowballs thrown at me, and you know, this, even you, this is years later. Oh yeah, years after. Yeah. Do you understand their anger? I do. I do understand it, and I don't. Uh, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm a human being. Nobody likes to, you know, to deal with that. But I, but I do understand it. I do understand that, you know, 80% of the people still don't forgive me, and I understand that too. And I'm not writing the book for them to forgive me. That's for sure. Well, that's good. Um, that was that was the question. Is this a book asking for forgiveness? Absolutely not. No, I don't. I don't make any excuses for my actions, and and you can judge me the way that you want to judge me. I mean, it, it's hurtful. Of course it's hurtful. You know, I, I don't want, now if it was something where, you know, and my wife now she's pregnant and, and I'm walking my kid down the, down in a, in a store and I get a comment in the store, it's probably going to be a little bit different because you're involving my child or, you know, right. something like that. But, 
you know, I, I got big shoulders. I think I can take it, but I understand it. You know, and there's been some people. I remember when I spoke at uh, Carroll College, one of the coaches there, Coach Hogan, it was the very first place that I spoke. And uh, Coach Hogan pulled me aside and he says, Joe, I just want you to know, it was right before I went out to give the speech, which was tough, <laughs> tough timing for me. He goes, hey, I just want you to know that, you know, what you did, you know, I, I, I haven't forgiven you for it yet. And I understand that, you know, but I, I went to a Hall of Fame dinner for Mike Van Deest, who is the head coach at Carroll College, and he's still there, Coach Hogan, and, and this is five years later now. And uh, he finally came up to me and said, hey, Joe, I, I've forgiven you five years later. So sometimes it takes five years. Sometimes it's going to take a lifetime. Some people are never going to forgive me. You know, I get looks. I, I work in Bozeman. I do contracting. I'm a, you know, I work, own a construction company. And so I do some work in Bozeman. And so I'm down there maybe for a month, a year, basically just off and on. And, you know, and so I go into the restaurants that I used to go to and the old Coach Heisel that, that Pokey Allen knew very well. He's a very, very dear friend of mine, almost like a father to me. He's got Parkinson's disease. So I, when I go there, I take him places and stuff that he likes to go. And I get the same looks from the from the older alumni and stuff like that, and you know some of the s snubs that I used to, and um, it's just it is what it is. Th this book isn't about any of that. This book is about helping the next person along or somebody to maybe think about some of these things that's happening yeah. to them. Quite often, someone who is in recovery makes mm -hmm. that step to tell their, their story. In fact, that's that's very much a part of mm -hmm. of recovery is talking about your story and and admitting admitting the faults. Is that the genesis of this book? Some, I mean, somebody said to me a long time ago, just keep repeating it if you don't get it out. You know, you'll just keep repeating your past and how you grew up and the things that you've done and the things that you've done be before if you don't just get it out in some way. You know, my form was in the form of writing a book, you know, and I, and I had a great person that, that, was, that was willing and able, and it, and it was always in the back of my mind. Um, you know, Bob, I mean, he, he didn't know it, but he was always in the back of my mind because I just thought that when Pokey wrote that book, I just felt like, wow, you know, there's, you know, even way back when he wrote it, before I had this problem, before, or before I got arrested, I just felt like there was, there was going to be a time in my life where I wanted to write it and get it out, so. At the, at the point of your arrest, the, could you explain how the meth uh, distribution ring was working? You weren't actually you know, in the corner selling drugs to no, students. No. I never sold drugs to anybody. If anything, I was a user of it. I mean, I made a, I made a couple phone calls to, uh, you know, conspiracy is basically you get charged with, and again, I'm not making any excuses. I was guilty of, of having a part in it at all. And, um, but basically I made a, uh, some phone calls that hooked a, another person up and, um, and then the transactions were made between them and, uh, you know, there was selling involved. Obviously I'm not well, not, I guess not obviously, because anybody could, but I'm not selling drugs personally. No. And, um, and then, you know, it's... No, I, I, you know they're, telling, they're giving me the signal that we have run out of time, and I, I don't want to end on okay. that. But what we're going to do is uh, go on into our web extra. We'll talk a little bit more about the extra. We've got a phone call. We'll take the phone call. So for now, let me say thank you. You're, it, is, it, is an insp it is an inspirational story. Though. Thank you. And thank I you appreciate, for having me. I appreciate you both coming on. I appreciate Bob. I appreciate you, you being here. And we do have more information. Check it out at the Dialogue website. We'll, as I said, we'll continue the discussion in our web extra. Find it all at IdahoPTV.org. Just click on Dialogue, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, and join us next time for Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.